Well, I am Dr. Mahanes, and <clears throat> I do work for food. That's why I'm here. <clears throat> Listen, I'm, <clears throat> I'm sure that you all are probably tired of hearing about epidemics uh, all the time. And we've certainly had our share of them uh, over the years that, uh, that I've been in medicine and that you all have been listening to things about your health and stuff like that. But the particular one I'm going to talk about today is, uh, I think, one of the most important issues that we've had to deal with in a long time. And it seems like it sort of snuck up on us uh, in a way uh, because uh, we just, it seems of a sudden we've realized the impact that it's made on all of us as citizens. My role in it uh, as a supplier and your role in it as a demander. And that's the issue that we're having to deal with as far as prescription <coughs> drugs are concerned. Um, and specifically to talk about what we call prescription painkillers or prescription narcotics. And um, so I, I wanna try to enlighten you a little bit today if I can about some of the aspects of this, how, how we've gotten here and what we're trying to, to do about it. Um, and, uh, and, and as I said, it, it, it affects us all. Now, a few years ago when I was getting, uh, uh, once again, uh, pretty active uh, in the practice of surgery and other things without the afro and all that to go with it, <laughs> um, I discovered that uh, in our community that there seemed to be an excessive demand for painkillers and it was being excessively prescribed by our physicians. And the other thing that I incorporated that with is when I looked at the coroner statistics for 2009, I found that 30, of the 36 people in our county that died accidentally, uh, you know, they, they fell off of a building or something like this. This excluded uh, automobile accidents and stuff like that. But out of those 36 people, 25 of them were dead from drug overdose. Unintentionally now, unintentionally. But taking too much, too many, or however the mixture was that was going together. So I went to the medical staff uh, up at the, the hospital in Pickens and I said, uh, you know, this is, some, something's wrong with this. And, and, we, and we've got to do something about it. Well, you know, when you do that, you open your mouth, you know what happens, you get the job, right? So I got the job. And so, so what we did up there was we formed a task force. We tried to bring a group of people together so that we could sit down and talk about this and see what we could do. And on the screen, you see the variety of people that I asked to join this cause and come together for us. And they did. And what we wanted to do was, we wanted to try to determine the root cause of the problem. Why were they being prescribed so often? Why were people demanding to want to take them so much? Uh, we wanted to edu educate our medical community about the problem because they are the suppliers, okay? There's the guys who write the prescriptions. We wanted to try to develop some solutions to it. And also, we wanted to try to inform and educate the public. And um, so that's, that's, part, that's part of this uh, program today. Now last week, as you might have known, we had a, a, a rally up at uh, Pickens High School where we had a, a panel discussion from some important people involved in this. Uh, the turnout to me was uh, unpleasing, but at the same time we still got a lot of press from it which I was very happy about. It, it, uh, it perfused into the community, and, uh, and a lot of you all may have read something uh, about that uh, in, in, in the papers. So, so it, di it, it did have its value, but didn't go quite as far as I wanted it to. Now, in an effort for us to try to reach those goals that I said about, well, here's who we brought together. We brought the DEA, we brought liability consultants, we brought addiction counselors, we brought medical experts, we had personal testimonials, we had pharmacists, and other groups of people that came and educated our community and our task force on this problem. Not, they, weren't, they weren't telling us about the 
chemistry of these drugs necessarily and how they all work, we kind of understood that. But to try to give us some inroads into the, the issues of how they're getting out there, what the distribution is, and how can we try to take them back, because they were some of our goals. And not long, long after we got started with our task force up there in Pickens, then Baptist Easley came on board with us. And we changed our, um, our name to what we call now the Prescription Drug Abuse Alliance. That's where the two communities are together now. And you know, and often we think of Clemson as being some uh, foreign land down there, you know. But Clemson is a part of Pickens County. And I kind of forgot about that myself. I said, what the heck? We've left them out of this equation. So now we're bringing them in. That's, that's their next step. Because I don't know whether you know it or not, but uh, drugs are pretty rampant on the campus at uh, Clemson University. And, and I don't mean illegal drugs, I mean prescription drugs. I mean Lortab, Vicodin, Oxycontin, those things. They bring a lot of money on the street and they do a lot of harm. So we're, we're, we're encompassing them into this uh, process for us. And what we wanted to do with the group, the two hospitals that got together is that we wanted to combine their resources. We didn't want to have competing <coughs> ideas. We wanted to share data and whatnot. And it was a shared responsibility for the educational process. And that's really gone very well. And the leadership down here has been extremely helpful, and especially Dr. Lori Karnsu, who's a family physician uh, down in Liberty, who's on the staff here, has been um, a leader in this uh, along with me, and we've been, we, we've been very happy about that. Now, uh, at about the same time that we were getting all this started in 2010, along came the Center for Disease Control, and they said, hey guys, we've got a national epidemic of this stuff, you know? And, uh, and so it, it was, it, like I said, it was almost like a, a bomb went off that, that everybody recognized this across the United States and all sorts of groups were getting involved, senior groups, youth groups, uh, behavioral health services, and these youth boards and things that were coming along. Everybody was jumping on board and said, hey, we gotta do something about this, but the hardest thing was finding solutions. Well, what happened was, and I know that, that you all can't uh, read this, and, and I apologize for this, but I'll point out a couple of things. The CDC came out with some pretty interesting statistics. One of them was that uh, in that particular year, there were 22,000 deaths in the United States of uh, unintentional drug overdoses from prescription drugs. South Carolina was 23rd in the uh, per capita number of pills being prescribed um, for that, and we were 23rd also in the overdose deaths in South Carolina. In 2010, there, I mean 2011, there were 225 deaths across the state of South Carolina with unintentional drug overdoses. 30 of those were in Pickens County. It's an incredible number. Um, what is it? Well, we, we're still not really sure that we know yet. And then here's a statistic at the bottom here. The, the United, United States Americans are 4.6% of the world population, okay? But we consume 80% of the global supply of opioids, narcotics. 80% of the total supply, 99% of the supply of hydrocodone. If anybody knows what hydrocodone is, that's your lower tab and stuff like that. So, pretty incredible statistics. And then it, it, it went on about the, the, the sales and number of teens that were tried and stuff like that. And then as we were getting ready to have our meeting uh, last week, the, uh, the partnership for drugfree.org came out with their statistics on teens involvement in this. And, uh, and you can see on the board there, it was up 33% since 2008. And about a quarter percent of all the teenagers that they surveyed somehow were in the number of the first abuse or, or uh, you know, how they misused it or how they represented it to somebody else. An incredible amount of statistics. The, the interesting thing about this is that the, and, and I think that maybe the press that went out last week was a little bit mistaken. The, 
the people that are dying from this are in the age group of 45 to 50 to 55. They're not teenagers. But the teenagers are the ones that are learning about it and getting involved in it early. And you should have heard what the principal at Pickens High School had to say about it. It would be shocking to you the number of instances of arrest and in things that are made at the high school or children that are pulled in and they're disciplined, not only in high school, but even in middle school. And you know where they're getting a lot of these pills? From parents and medicine cabinets. And, and uh, <laughs> there's a lot of little interesting stories about medicine cabinets that I can tell you. But this was a dra dramatic thing, I thought, that, that came out at the, boat the same time that we were talking about all these things. All right, well, who's responsible for this, okay? Who are the culprits? Well, one, us, the doctors. We're the suppliers. We write the prescriptions. And you'll understand maybe why we write some of them the way we do. Not all of us. And there are some of us that are more involved in this than, than others, and they're under scrutiny, but we'll get to them. The government is involved as well, and I'll clear that up for you and, and for, for an understanding. And of course, the public at large, because you're the guys who take them. And I mean, you know, it's not, I'm not implying anything by that, it's just the truth. The public at large takes them. So what's the, what's the deal here? Well, and this is another one that unfortunately you can't see very well, but I'll, I'll go through it if I may, because I think it's important. I think the public has learned from us, okay? They've learned from the medical community, because number one, in the 1990s, all the healthcare regulate, regulatory agencies came out with pain as the fifth vital sign. Now, how many people have been in their doctor's office lately for a checkup? Took your blood pressure, took your temperature, took your pulse, and what else did they ask you? And do you have any pain? Do they have any pain? It's what's your pain scale? And so you give them that little smiley, you know, I'm a 10, I'm a 10 over 10. And, and that's a, such a subjective thing that we're having to deal with in the medical um, thing. So the Joint Commission, that's the people who checks hospitals and accredits them, they came up with a pain scale. The little 1 to 10, you know, the little smiley face, you're happy and all, no pain, or you got the big frown on your face at, at number 10. In the 1990s also, doctors were being trained. Look, dude, when you go out there and take care of these people with pain, you have to prescribe them enough medicine for them to take that their pain is controlled. That was the educational process for it. And then, along in the 2000s, the satisfaction surveys started coming out. They were going to hospitals and patients were having to fill out these surveys, you know, was your room clean, was it cool enough at night, was it quiet and stuff like that, was your pain controlled? So people had to put, put that down as a registration and then the next thing they did, they linked that to reimbursement. Because if your satisfactory surveys aren't worth a hoot, well then your reimbursement's not going to be worth a hoot too. Now that's not the only thing, but that's one of them. And so it backed us against the wall. So do you think that maybe doctors might overprescribe a little bit? Well, they might. There's no question about that. So, and then here's the other thing is that they've bec drugs have become socially acceptable. Hey, it's from a doctor and it's FDA approved, so it's got to be safe, right? Or be able to take it. Uh, but we don't have any tolerance for pain in, in our society anymore, do we? We want relief now. We've got to have everything now. Uh, and we take pills for most anything, even normal function, bowel function, you know, not bowel function, excuse me. <laughs> normal, excuse me, normal body functions, we take pills for. And, e <laughs> and even uh, TV advertisement has sort of overwhelmed us with some of the things they put up. But you know, it's funny, most everything they ad uh, uh, advertise on TV, the end they say, you know, they also throw in this could kill you, you know, would anybody want to take it? I'm not sure I would, but anyway, that's what, that's what, they, that's what they do to us. So, uh, and this is just a little thing and I threw in at, at our meeting, but I'll tell you what, there was a Dr. Moore 
And this shows, this shows how far it goes back. This goes back to 1975 when this character was uh, convicted of what he did. But our law says that when we prescribe uh, a painkiller or other medications and stuff, it should be for a legitimate medical purpose. Should be. It should be done by a licensed practitioner, somebody who's re got regulatory status to be able to do that, and it should be prescribed within the in the ordinary course of a professional practice. Well, this gentleman gained so much notoriety because back in 1975 he was prescribing a drug called methadone. Have we heard of methadone? Methadone was developed back in World War II because the opium supply was going to be short so they wanted a painkiller on the battlefield. Well he got a hold of it and uh, all of his soldiers were just paying him a lot of money for whatever he prescribed for him and he got caught. So using, using him as a guideline and what happened to him in this one little clause within this law, the DEA is now watching physicians across the country and how, how they prescribe these things. Are they doing it for a legitimate purpose? Is it in the course of the usual professional practice? And if it's not, then they get under more scrutiny. Now I hope I'm not going too fast and I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not trying to use too many big words and I hope it will, we'll have some questions at the end and I'll try to go ahead and get through with this. Uh, now, and, and so how does our problem continue to be enhanced in this regard that there's so many, so many of these drugs out here? Well, one, one thing is that there are rogue clinics out there and a lot of them masquerade as so-called pain clinics where people with chronic pain are going and getting seen once a month or whatever getting a prescription for 180 tablets, you know, or whatever with refills and stuff like that to, to take home with. And we've got the so-called pill mills. And what pill mills are is just where an unscrupulous physician, and that's the other part of this, the unscrupulous doctor who is prescribing things for people in return for other favors. So you can guess what some of the other favors might be for that. But the, but the pill mills are where a doctor just sets up shop, no stethoscope, no nothing. He's just sitting at a desk. You come in and say, doctor, uh, I'd like to get my prescription renewed. So he'll write you your prescription. You lay down your $300, you go at the door. And the most popular place for this has been in Florida, where in the, in, uh, from 2009, I think, to 2011, the number of pill clinics like that went from something like 36 to like 180 or something like that, scattered through Dade County and everything in Florida. But now they're shutting those down. And uh, even the states that surround us, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, are doing the th same thing with some of the legislative uh, issues that, that they are, are bringing in. Um, so, um, so anyway, in, in summary to this, we had the an inspector general for the state of South Carolina uh, become involved with us uh, back about six months ago. And, uh, and he has taken a, a bead on this uh, uh, for the state of South Carolina because of the magnitude of the problem that we have. And we have risen from 23rd up to 11th now in some of these categories of prescription per capita for people. And in his, in his uh, uh, summary of a, uh, a strategy that he's developed, he said, prescription painkillers are incredibly effective in medical treatments and life-saving medications for many people. So it's critical to address this epidemic problem without impacting a physician's ability to prescribe to a patient in need. And I think that's extremely important, uh, very important, because there, those are things that, that we do need. And uh, as some of you might well know, the intention for some of these things that were developed and originally prescribed were for people who had malignancies that were in hospice or, or in their last stages of their life and suffering indeed in pain and you can understand the use of that but it's just it's gone beyond that and it's gotten out of hand and um, and something that happens every day it seems to me as I deal with this and here's something else that's hot off the press to me today I just got this in my email <laughs> before I left 
And this is from an outfit called Drug, Drug Free Workplace is where it comes from. And what they were talking about is the statistics that have come up now of what's called drug driving. Remember we had such a problem, problem with drunk driving? Now we got the problem with drug driving. And, and here's the issue. It said, the most recent research conducted in the U.S. found that 33% of fatally injured drivers with known drug test results were positive for drugs other than alcohol. 33% of them. And a lot of those were prescription drugs. And we know that. We know that every time we go uptown, cross 123 or somebody, there's somebody driving along that's probably taken hydrocodone, a couple of Ativan or whatever, who knows what that morning. Now, it's, it's surprising that people do that, deal with that, go to work every day and stuff like that. They do, we, we know that. And it's, it's it, 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 I don't know, it must be beneficial in some way to get them through it. But when you think about it, you say, my gosh, what's the problem? Now, in the coroner's office, we learn, you know, what the, what the, the kind of the fatal trinity of those drugs were. And there was hydrocodone, a drug called Flexoril, and a drug called Xanax. And I think everybody has heard of those. That's the holy trinity, as they say. You put that together, and you can be in some serious trouble. And how do these drugs affect you? What, what, is, what does it do? Why do people wake up dead from taking these things? Well, well what, what? Nobody wants to do that, right? Well, what, ha what happens is that these things, they, they, uh, especially the narcotics, work on our brain stem. And our brain stem is a thing that controls our blood pressure, our breathing, you know, a pulse rate and stuff like that. And all you've got to do is overload that rascal and you're done. Okay? You just slide into sleep and, you know, the wagon comes and gets you. That's the way it sort of comes out. And in and, 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 and the greatest part of the time, it is unintentional. People are not intending that. Sometimes these things will make you forget that you already took it. And you'll go back and take another and stuff like that. And one thing about it is that it, they say, they tell me that, that people, when they take that first one and it gives them the jolt, whatever it is for the, those people who have that, you can't ever reach that level again. And that's what people continue to try to do. And that's what I learned about cocaine. Now, cocaine works on a different part of the brain. But people who first use cocaine get the biggest thrill they're ever going to get. And what they try to do is continue to try to make it better, but they can't. And all they're doing is just toxifying themselves by doing that. And the problem is that these drugs have addictive qualities, and we out there have addictive tendencies. We, we don't know that, but we may. Now, I can tell you my personal story. This is a personal testimonial. <laughs> When I had Dr. Finley operate on my knee down here about 10 years ago and did a little scoping procedure, when I left, he gave me a prescription for Lortab, 10 milligrams, because he said I was going to have some pain. Now, I'm not much of a pain killer taker. I, 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 don't, I never liked them and I don't take them. But anyway, I was going to a meeting over in Greenville for the next morning. My wife and I decided to go over and spend the night in the hotel where the meeting was. So all I have to do is just get up the next morning in my crutches and go down. Well, anyway, about halfway over there, I said, gosh, this thing is really killing me, honey. I need something for pain. So she, I had some water with me, and, uh, and so she gave me a tablet, and I chugged it down and whatnot. Well, I'm going to tell you, by the time I got to the Hilton in Greenville, I was a maniac. I could not sit still. She could not make me sit still. I was walking without my crutches. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what I was doing. And she was threatening to, she was just threatening to call 911 on me, you know? So whatever she did, I finally calmed down. Well, I've never taken another one. Now that's my experience. And I know people have different experiences and obviously they have a pleasant experience. And that's what kind of evolve, makes the process evolve and, and go forward. So, so sort of in a nutshell, I can, uh, you can see, I think, that this is an epidemic. It's profusive through the United States. Drug overdose deaths from prescription painkillers are now outclassing 
automobile vehicle accidents in about 20 states across the United States already. And that, you, that was their number one, wasn't it? There were 50,000 people there were, were dying every year from that. Now it's, it's from, from drug overdose. So, so what, what's, the, what's, the, the, what's the final warning? Well, I, it's, it's not a, a, a warning, but the suggestion is there's no question that if you need something for pain and it's been prescribed for you, you should take it. Your pain should be relieved. There's no question about that. You should, at the same time, though, look for alternatives as well. Is it heat? Is it ice? Is it massage? Is it walking? Is it a hot tub? Um, or what is it? A stiff drink? Maybe that <laughs> should be part of it. But, uh, but, but don't, 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 don't take that I'm trying to take this away from anybody. That's not what I mean at all, because it is important. But people just need to be careful. Be careful because it can catch up with you almost b before you know it. So that's my little tale, <laughs> and I'll entertain any questions that anybody might have about it.